Welcome to the Nord Pentecostal Church live stream, a place to be family. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Church Online. We are hosting our very first in-house service since March, and it is uh, it's an exciting day to do so today, but we also are continuing with this approach to record our sermons and to make them uh, presentable to you so that you can enjoy online if you choose not to join with us today. We will get back to having other faces in front of you, welcome you into service, praying you into service, but I wanted to take today to invite you once again, if you are looking for an opportunity to join with us, we are here 9.30 and 11 uh, on Sundays as an opportunity to enter into worship one, uh, with one another. So we do invite you out. There's no pressure on that. It's totally up to you. And we understand if you choose not to attend, but those are your times. And uh, there is a link online available to our registration. We just ask that you simply register before you come so that you can join with us in how our services happen and be a part of this family in person, though you are still a part of our family uh, when you're online. And we look forward to joining with you, however that looks. Let's take a moment and pray for our service today. Father, I thank you for what you are doing in our midst. We do thank you for the freedom to gather and we pray for safety, uh, Lord, that this virus will not touch us. Um, God, we know it's something that's out there, but we are praying, Lord, that you would protect what is uh, happening. Lord, we also pray that this would come to an end. We believe in your ability and your power to do incredible things out of nowhere. And so, Lord, we look to you in this, that you would give wisdom where it's due, but you would also remove this season, that we could once again understand what it means to be church gathered together and not take for granted what you are doing right now. Lord, would you be with us as we worship, as we enter into your presence? Would you fill us with peace to know that you are still on the throne and you are in control? Lord, surround our worship and the word today in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join us as we sing. People say that the only thing you can count on in life is, is uh, death and taxes. But there's one more thing is change. Uh, we're outside, we're inside, we're outside, we're, and now we're changing again. This is supposed to be outside, but we're inside. How many people like change? You know, I've told a lot of people I love change, as long as it's not me. And that's what a lot of people think. As long as it, but there's one change that I love. The song says, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus, since Jesus. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart.
beyond I can see since Jesus came into I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. Oh, and I'm happy, oh, so happy, onward I go. Since Jesus. What to say, Lord, it's you gave me life and I can't explain just how much you mean to me that you've saved me lord i give all that i am to you that every day i can be the light that shines your name every day it's you i live for every day i follow after you every day i walk with Every day, Lord, I'll learn to stand upon your word, and I pray that I, I might come to know you more, that you would guide me in every single step I take, that every day I can be a light unto you. say Lord what to say you take all the pieces of my life broken and shattered put them all back together all these pieces broken and scattered 
in mercy gathered, mended and whole, empty handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free, I've been set. How sweet the sound that saves a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, now I am found with blind, but now I see, I can see you now. How sweet the sound, because he loves us so. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. And all the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God, oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found and leaves tonight. 
Father, just wrap your arms around your children. Draw them close to you as they look to you in every situation. Strengthen them in their mind, body, and spirit as we look to you and call upon your name. In the name of Jesus, amen. Would you join me as we take a moment this morning to pray for the sermon? Father, I thank you for what you've shared into my heart. Lord, I pray as I present this that you would speak to me continually. That if there's anything in there that I've prepared, Lord, that, that you don't want said. Would you move us onward? And anything, Lord, that is said today, would it be of great impact to those who are listening? God, that we can see 
what you have done years ago and how it still echoes to us today and that we could be that voice of hope that we would be the ones who enter into life with the power that you've given us, the authority that you've set on your church, and that we would be a witness to the glory of God and the grace of Jesus. So, Father, we invite you to speak to our hearts, first to me and then to each who listens. Use this time, Lord, to minister to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. We are uh, looking at a sermon today that I'll tell you the title of in a few moments, but I want to ask you a question. What is the most frequently used term in the last six months? Do you, do you know what it is? Something that's been used all over media, all over social media, the news says it all the time. Single word, unprecedented. We, we hear it all the time. We see it in the newspapers, magazines, everywhere. These are unprecedented times. These are moments where we just don't know what's going to happen. It's, it's not happened to us before. We don't know how to live through it. We're just going day by day. It's unprecedented. Uh, I came to the point where I got tired of hearing that word. Heidi actually says, I hate the word unprecedented. I don't ever want to hear it again. And I understand where that comes from because really it's, it's a word that just, it kind of irks you now. Like everything's unprecedented. It is. I agree with that. But I... I I struggle with hearing the word because we use it so much. In leadership circles, it's the same as the word pivot. We use that so much and it's time to find a different word. We are in unprecedented times, but we're going to look at something that is of precedent. So as a church, those who follow Christ, those who have authentic faith, we are actually called to be the ones who set the precedent on this earth. Um, though the season's unprecedented, we have before us a precedent to follow. And I said a few weeks ago that the church, uh, the world needs a church that looks different than they do, different than we do right now, because we have to be honest, we've become far too similar to the world in the last few years, in the last few decades, really. Now, Kerry Newhoff this week, he's a, a Canadian pastor, he posted an article about the image of the church in 2020 and how uh, we have become a reflection of the world. In the post, he says the following statement under a subpoint, which was titled, The Church is an Alternative to Culture, not a reflection of it. Here's what he says. People don't just want to know what you think is right. They want to know what is real. As a Christian leader, you're not pointing to yourself. You're pointing people to Jesus. What's real is deeper than just your opinion. You're pointing people to an alternative kingdom. In your church, if your church is just a reflection of some liberal or conservative ideology, you'll lose the next generation. They're not looking for a reflection of culture. They're looking for an alternative to it. Nobody finds life in your kingdom. They find life in Christ's kingdom. Talking about yourself and your viewpoints on the world in a loud voice isn't cutting it and getting louder will likely only further erode your influence. Now, he's speaking directly to pastors and to church leaders and leaders in general, but it's the knowledge in this that we come to understand we're not supposed to reflect culture and be like what they are doing, but we're supposed to set a precedent that is different than what culture has. And over the last number of weeks, I've been reflecting on the church as a whole, not just my church, not just NPC, but the church as a whole. Now, I haven't been consuming outside material to kind of sway my opinion of it, but this article came across my newsfeed um, this week, shared by somebody that many of you know who used to pastor in Havelock, Pastor Ralph, who's now out in, uh, in BC. And he shared that article and I read it and I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty timely. But what I've done is I've just tried to remain in a place where I'm available to the Spirit's voice to, to hear what he's saying. And in that, today, I bring you a message called Setting the Precedent. We're going to go into the book of Acts this morning and start right at the beginning of chapter 1. For those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the book of Acts, it's Luke's follow-up to the writing of his gospel. In the, uh, in the book of Luke, in the gospel of Luke, he takes time to break down what Jesus did while on the earth. And in the book of Acts, it's the follow-up of Jesus having ascended to the throne and this is what happens in the early church. 
Um, so it starts at the moment when the disciples receive the Holy Spirit in their lives in the early stages of planting and developing of churches around the globe. And I would suggest to you today that the church today, right now, should still be a reflection of what the church was in Acts. This is the precedent that is given to us. And the story does not end in chapter 28 of Acts uh, with Paul's beginning to preach. It actually carries with us today. We carry the story of Acts forward if we are willing to do so. We're going to look at verses 1 through 8 in Acts chapter 1. It says, In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen, after his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And after that, he was taken up into heaven before their very eyes. So this is the opening of Luke's book about the actions of the apostles, who God used to take a fledgling movement and, steer, and, and stream it across the countryside. A movement which would reach entire cities for the Lord as outlined in Acts 9.35 and would see entire countries saturated in the gospel as we see in Acts 19.10. Now, when I read the book of Acts, I'm reminded that these leaders are people um, leaders and people in the church are not reacting to anything in the world. They're not reacting to what's happening around them. They're actually responding to the Spirit. They're acting according to the voice of Jesus in their lives. Their accomplishments are not rooted in their heritage or natural abilities, though God will use those. They are, people who had, they are not people who had great influence or political clout. They didn't have nobility, and some of them didn't even have much education. They are people who simply were convinced of the priorities within the kingdom of God. They were willing servants who said yes to God and refused to hold anything back from him. Here's a short list that you'll find in Acts, but I'm asking you take this week and read the entire book, maybe even read it a few times over and let God speak into your life. Peter is a simple fisherman and he becomes the leader of the church in Jerusalem. Philip becomes the first evangelist and missionary to cross-cultural groups. Stephen stands against the false religious leaders, becoming the first martyr. Barnabas and Paul establish the first equipping church in Antioch, and they lead the first known missions team. Now, these are the things the early church was marked by. This was the precedent set within the book of Acts, along with the incredible displays of God's glory and a people hungry for the presence, not just on a Sunday when a pastor stood before them and delivered a word from God uh, out of his scripture, but literally every day they discovered that the God they worshiped is real, alive, and moving as they are open to him. They accomplished so much, so much in a short span of time, not because it was the start of the movement, but because they were governed by the priorities of God. They are incarnate with the power of God, motivated by his purposes, and are dependent on him to make the way. Now, many leaders come from within the church in these early days without competing issues because it would seem their overall commitment was to impact the world for Christ, to not accomplish their own preference, but to simply minister to others. Now, I've titled this message Setting the Precedent for two reasons. The first is because Jesus was doing just this in these eight verses. He spent three years equipping the disciples for ministry that they would take up after his death, his resurrection and ascension. When he defeated the grave, he spent 40 days appearing to witnesses, giving them undeniable truths of his resurrection. These are truths that if necessary, they could take to trial and prove that Jesus is who he says he is. Then he sends the spirit to empower them 
for the mission the church still holds today to be his witnesses throughout the world. And when Jesus left the disciples with that final statement, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses to the end of the earth. That includes you watching or hearing this, that you would receive power from the Spirit and you would be his witnesses throughout the world, even here in Norwood. Paul echoes this in 1 Corinthians 5.18 when he tells the church that God has given us the ministry of reconciliation. See, Jesus spent his time on earth reconciling people to the Father and then he invited us into the ministry of reconciliation. He's done the groundwork with his sacrifice on the cross and now he's employed us into his service. Not so that we'll sit around and hope that someone else gets passionate about it, but literally to see the ministry of Jesus, that reconciliation of others to the heart of the Father, continue through our own hands and feet. That we would be the extension of Jesus. The second reason for this sermon is this. And I admit it is an opinion, as I have watched the church from inside and out of distance over the years, but it's also set by discerning the times. We have lost sight of mission and we've allowed culture to set the precedent for us. And now we've simply begun following that lead instead of being the front runner. That's, that's my second reason. Across history, the church has been responsible for major scientific breakthroughs, healthcare, the law system, education, and many innovations across technology, economics, social atmospheres, to name just a few things that the church has been responsible for all while actually pursuing the image of Christ and reaching thousands with the gospel. But if I'm right and the precedent for the church to follow is in the passage that we've read, we have to come back to what we are called to because we have strayed from the position that God has set us into. Um, I want you to do this as a test. Take a look at the face of the church. Who do you see? When I say, let's, let's think about church, who do you see? Do you see the people around you? That's good. They're the body of Christ. But as the face of the church, who leads the church, who do you see? Do you think it's Pastor Larry because I'm on your computer screen right now? Do you think maybe it's the Pope because he leads millions of people? Do you think it's your favorite celebrity pastor? Let me be honest with you. If the first name that comes to mind is not Jesus, you begin to understand the issue that we've actually been walking through. As I preach this, there are churches who fight for their specific cause and not the ones within the kingdom. There are some who are concerned only that they get to meet and not for the greater good of the people around them or the needs of the people around the corner. There are denominations who have actually filed to become political parties instead of impacting their communities and countries with the gospel. Biblical truths have been discarded in preference, uh, sorry, have been discarded for preferences. Christians turn to celebrities and progressively worsening trends to answer their life's questions and fill the voids that they feel. Theology has been sacrificed for pleasing ideologies. Our message has become more about what we stand against than what we stand for. And the name of Jesus is more often used as a curse word than for the power that contains within it. As Kerry Newoff said, we are to be an alternative, a counterculture, not a reflection of the one around us. And I'll be honest, there is much about the things that we do that point to self and culture more than they do to Jesus. Now, I'm not speaking specifically of my church or maybe even of your church, but as we look at the church in general, that's where I'm speaking. But I'll tell you, we're not innocent of this. I'm not innocent of these things. Over the last few weeks, what God has been giving me is a prompting to reevaluate everything I do, to put aside the trivial things and focus on eternal truths, which is developing itself into a series as well for a later time. But he's been speaking to me on the principles of faith, the, the, the mission that I've been given and the calling that I personally live within. At a grander level, there have been conversations between God and I about how this actually plays out and what it's going to look like over time. But my main thing right now is the belief that we need to get back to being a people who set the precedent. Not ones who take our cue from culture and follow along willingly and powerlessly, but the ones who actually stand out in front 
and set the goal lines. I believe the church today has within it people who will turn the spiritual climate around in North America and the world. We have become somewhat complacent in our setting and that shows when something like this pandemic falls on us. Whether we can meet inside our buildings or not, in person or online, or maybe not at all, that's not the issue we need to be concerned about. Our concern should be are we individually and corporately seeking Jesus and setting the precedent for the next generation to follow, for culture to see our anchor of hope, for our families to know who Jesus is, and that they would then desire to have him in their lives as well. Are we more concerned about coming into a building or about people knowing Jesus? Am I passionate about this? Absolutely. Maybe just a little, because I know that we have an identity to claim and to walk in, but I feel like we have willingly missed the mark because of comfort. But let me tell you, it's time to turn these tables. So we're going to take a look at exactly what this means for the church. Now, I'll tell you that I do agree that we are living, as I said, in unprecedented times. We don't know what tomorrow holds. However, we have already, as a church, been given a standard. The precedent that was given by Jesus is attainable and it's simplistic in its approach. It's an open door to any who would enter, but it's also inclusive of every person who would call Jesus Lord. It's not really optional. It's a standard that he's put on us. There's no hidden agenda or expectation within the words of Jesus and the ones that he spoke to those disciples. And it very much extends to the church today. We're not exempt from the mission of Christ because a couple of millennia have passed by. If anything, we actually need to stand within this mission and it's more important as every day passes by. If you read the Bible through from front to end or any portion of the New Testament, you'll come to understand that we're living in what Jesus calls the end times, those last days. This is the days leading up to the return, the promise of Jesus to come back and to take his church. Each one, uh, the church is each one who declares that they trust and follow Jesus, those who carry the gift of faith the Father has given. Now, each day that passes, we approach this day at a pace which would speak to us, the need, should speak to us, the need to understand the precedent has been given and it's our time to continue to set it. When Peter and Paul preached to others, they did so with the belief that they were living in the last days, that they were just prior to the return of Christ. They lived in such a way that if Jesus returned the next day, he would be so elated about the things that they were doing. They lived in such a way that they presented the gospel at every corner. It gave them the passion to serve the mission of Christ with incredible obedience. Now I fear that we have lost sight of the knowledge that Jesus will soon come for his church. And in this, we are losing opportunity to live by the Spirit and be his witnesses. Now it's time today to set aside preference and to take up missional living for the call and the cause of Christ. So let's review how simple this process actually is. Jesus said you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Here's what is interesting about this. Modern day preachers, they tend to set a process to receive the Spirit. I've seen certain pastors stand up and they say, I'm calling specific people to come and pray because it'll only happen if those people are the ones who pray. They declare that they have some kind of standard over others. I've heard others say that you have to say certain words in order to receive it. And, and still others who have a belief that if you don't set the atmosphere just right, the spirit doesn't want to show up. So they turn all the lights off and they paint everything black and they make it like, I don't know, sometimes they employ fog machines and they make this sense of spirituality. But there's no magical words that we have to wait for a pastor to say. The Spirit is not a tool of man. He is God's ambassador for Christ who reveals truth to those who follow and fills the willing with his power. Jesus never said, do all these things first and then I'll send the Spirit. He told his disciples two things. First, um, while he was before he ascended, uh, he said, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them and he said, receive 
the Holy Spirit. That was that first instance when they came to understand the power of the Spirit and who the Spirit was and he came within them. But then he said to them these two important words, go and wait and power will come upon you from the Spirit. Do you want to know what the magical formula is from the Bible to receive the Spirit? Seek him, ask, wait, and receive. That, that's it. That's literally the formula to receive the Spirit. We ask, and it opens the door, and then we wait, and in that we become obedient, willing, and open to his presence. And as we receive, as he gives himself to us, we become emboldened passionate, and more concerned about the salvation of the lost than about how comfortable it will be when we open our mouth to talk about Jesus and how good God has been to us. Ask, wait, receive. Now, can I say something profound to you? Not that hopefully some of this has been profound already, but I want to say something else, and it's not even that you have an option to it because I'm going to say it. The world does not understand the glory of God. Now, it's not because it is incredibly mysterious or because he holds back any of it, but because they don't see the glory of God in his church. Now, I'm not talking about the flow of gifts or ardent worship or miraculous moments or even revival itself, which in some areas of the world is happening. I'm speaking of the manifest goodness of a God who daily wants to fill his people with an incredible power that changes the world. When Moses came down from the mountain after receiving the commandments, he came down and his, he was marked by a glow. He, his face was glowing. Now, people around him saw that and they were afraid. So Moses covered his face. He put a veil over his face and he would walk with the veil over his face until he would then go and meet with the Lord as he often did in the tent of meeting or somewhere else. And he would talk face to face like friends do. And when he left the tent, his face was glowing again. So he put the veil back on. The interesting thing of all this is that was the mark of the goodness of God. Now we might not have this glowing face as we reflect the glory of God outwardly, but the goodness of God was poured out on Moses and the people were marked by its presence among them. They knew and understood what the glory of God looked like because Moses willingly became that vessel. What if we become those people? Again, not that we're going to glow, but what if we became those people? And not just the pastor, not just the guy who stands up to speak, not the worship leaders only, not, not the board, but what if every person in the church, everyone who says, I'm a Christian, I believe, I follow Jesus, he is my Lord. What if we all became those people? If we obediently prayed, come Holy Spirit, come in power, come manifest the full goodness of God upon my life. Let the world see his glory in my life and in my witness. Now, listen, because I say this in truth. When the power comes on you, it changes your life in incredible ways. But what the power is not is chaotic. The power of the Holy Spirit is not chaotic. The Holy Spirit does not cause division or disruption in the kingdom. He does not confuse or lead people to extra biblical ideas. He does not set things upon you that you are not open and actively seeking to receive. He is order. He, he does things in powerful ways, but he only speaks and does the things that the Father speaks to him. And those are the things that we actively see at work in Scripture. The Spirit moves according to what God speaks to him. Precedent has been given, and it does not change. He sets the atmosphere, and we follow that order. Receive the Spirit. Walk in his power. Jesus then told the disciples that they would be his witnesses. Now, the Bible tells us that some are set as evangelists. To some people, he gets them the office of the evangelist. And I think somewhere along the way, we must have decided so that means there's only a few people who are going to be the witnesses now because they're the evangelists. But it's simply not the case. See, all are witnesses, but some have a very special anointing to work at the capacity and the level of a Billy Graham. But I want to tell you something. Billy Graham isn't the guy who is knocking on the doors everywhere saying, hey, why don't you come to my, to my crusade tonight? He wasn't going to your neighbors and to your brothers and, and, and to your workplace and inviting them. 
you were doing that as the witness. See, those crusades work by the evangelist and the witness coming together and doing what God has asked them to do and working in the power that the Spirit has put upon them. We are all witnesses. Yes, some are evangelists, but you're a witness. And all of us play a part in the story. So we can't continue to make excuses about being a witness while our, or, or, or that I don't want to be a witness because that person's an evangelist. We can't make those excuses while our neighbors are dying and spending eternity in hell. You've been called to be a witness of how good the Lord has been to you, every one of you. And I get it. There are moments that this is incredibly daunting. Maybe you feel like Peter did around the fire and you have that opportunity to share who Christ is. And Well, do you know who this Jesus is? But you feel like you want to deny him because it's just more comfortable than it is to expose yourself and put yourself out there for possible rejection and persecution. I get it. It's terrifying at times. There are moments where I was set out to share who Christ is and I cowered and I failed in that moment. But I discovered something. I was doing it alone or trying to do it alone. I mean, I have the spirit with me. He goes everywhere with me. He's, he's alive and active. And I hope to be a willing vessel who will hear his voice and do everything that he asks in those moments. But there are times when I get things out of order, when I go ahead of the spirit and I start doing and saying things that he has not directed me to do. And I realize quickly just how feeble my words are and how shockingly unattractive I can make things seem in the kingdom when I do things on my own. Now I learned quickly, pray first. Holy Spirit, come in power, speak through my words, be the one who is sharing in this moment. Simply use me. And I tell you, things go much better when you do it that way. Now am I still nervous at times? Absolutely. It, it, it's it's not easy for me to overcome all the introvert tendencies that are within me, but there is a sweetness to the moment when I trust the Spirit to come in power and help me to be his witness. This is the pattern. Receive first, then go be the witness. You will not go alone or in weakness when you follow these two items. It's a two-item list. Receive the power, go be the witness. My recommendation, having been in very traumatic uh, moments of sharing, is to start the day by praying for him to come in power. Don't wait, because you may forget, and then things can kind of get ugly. You have to ask to receive, so do it early and do it often. Now, I don't think I need to relay to you the geographical location of your witness. Jesus said, to the ends of the earth. It's my understanding, therefore, this means wherever the Spirit guides us, in our house, our neighbors, our workspace, or anywhere in this world. But do you know the parameters of the witness? Because it's not just your words. It's not just, can I tell you about Jesus today and tell you about salvation and the sweet mercies of God? It's not just words. If anything, it's actually much deeper than this. See, your witness is the life that you live. How you reflect and carry the glory of God is your witness. You are the, represent the representation of the kingdom and you serve a king who is full of love. One who desires to see all people escape an eternity of hell by receiving his covering of grace. Now we are told to live as those who are in the world, but not of the world. We're set apart from it. We don't reflect culture. We reflect the kingdom. We're an alternative, a counter to what the world is. But I worry sometimes that we are becoming a witness to our political and social leanings to the kingdom that we want to build, and not the kingdom we belong to in Jesus. Now, if I'm reading the scripture right, Jesus tells us to be his witnesses, not our own, and to do so to the ends of the world, everywhere. So I'll let you decide how you have to individually change for this. But know that the Spirit is already leading you. He's already speaking to you about how that change has to happen. For some of us, it won't be very much. For some, it might be giving up things that we hold very dear. It might just be a change in opinion or in just how we present things. Finally, and I quickly want to go through this. When we, we receive power, we will go be as witnesses and then everything else will follow. What I mean is that he will add to our lives other ministries, other gifts, 
items that need to flow to make us, uh, to bring us to a place where we better serve the kingdom. He will provide in us the passion to do what he is calling us to do, and he will equip us along the way. But if we go out of order and we try to do those things first before we receive the power and be his witnesses, we're doing it completely wrong. And that's where failure starts to set in. We can't just go and pursue things out of selfish ambition because we're suddenly governing our own approaches. We bypass the spirit. The precedent is receive the spirit, go be the witnesses. After the disciples did that in the upper room, they received the spirit, they became his witnesses at Pentecost, then everything else was added. It wasn't the other way around. Don't go ahead of the spirit. Receive first every day, then go out, and what is needed will follow. When we follow this precedent that was set by Jesus in Acts 1, we will see the, act, the, the church that is available and, and active in Acts 2 and in Acts 4 begin to take form. In that moment, we will, we will be the people who set the precedent of hope in a world that is lost and terrified. We will set the precedent of truth in a world that is full of confusion and lies. We will set the precedent of love in a world that is full of loneliness. When we receive first, then go, we become the people who set the precedent that the kingdom of God is among us. And God so desires to bring his kingdom to this earth just as it is in heaven. So let's become these people and see the church look much different than culture. Let's not be its reflection. Let's be an alternative. Let's be who Jesus called us to be. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have called us, Lord, to be an alternative to what culture is, different than the world. We are here for a mission, but we're not them. Father, for the short time that we're on this earth, I pray that we will receive power and go be your witnesses. Lord, that we will have an understanding of what you are calling us to and the identity that you have placed upon your church, that we are not weak, feeble individuals, but we are people who are set to be full of the power and the authority of Christ as we stand with you as co-heirs. As we call on you to receive all that you have promised to us. As we work through your spirit, not through might, not through our own power, not through our own words, but by your spirit, Lord. Father, I pray as we eagerly anticipate the return of Jesus to come and receive his church, his brothers and sisters, that we will look to eternity, but we will know that we can bring so many people that live around us along for the journey. Father, I don't want to see another one die and go to hell. Give your people a passion. Set us ablaze with the desire to share your glory, to be your witnesses through action, through lifestyle, through word, in every capacity and everywhere we turn, not just on a Sunday, but everywhere and every day. So Father, come, send your glory upon this earth. Shake things up, Lord. Bring us to our knees, closer to you, that we would cry out, send your spirit, and then send me. We give you thanks and praise today, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Pray that you have a blessed week, that you uh, would take time to enjoy the presence of God, to invite the power of the Spirit to come upon you, that you would be ready to be his witness to your neighbors, to your family, to your friends, to someone on the other side of the world. Whatever that looks like in your context as God leads you, be full of passion for him. Invite him to fill you with power. And he will do that. Have a wonderful week. This last song started going through my head a few days ago. I had another one picked up, but like me, I don't like change, but I change anyways. The song says, I believe, so why should I worry or fret? It says he holds the future in the palm of his hand. Oh, he has never failed me yet. I know he's reigning, and he still, he still has control. So why do I worry and fret? I know 
He told me he'd protect me and go with me each day. And brother, I have no reason to doubt. Oh, he's been so near every step of the way. And he will surely, he will surely lead his children on out. I believe. Oh, I, I believe. I believe. So why should I worry your friend or your he holds the future in the palm of his hand, and he has never failed me yet. I know he is reigning and he still has control, so why should I worry your friend? I know he holds the future, oh, and I know he holds my hand. I know just as sure as I'm singing this song, I'm a part almighty plan I, I believe oh I, I believe I believe so why should I wear your friend he told me he'd protect me and go with me each day and brother I have no reason to doubt he's been so near Every step of the way, he will surely lead his children out. There are some people who live each day in fear of what tomorrow may bring. Oh, but I'm trusting in the one who has walked in so near. Oh, I'm talking about the king of all kings. I know he holds the future, and I know. Why should I worry? Why should I worry? 